Short for GNU Image Manipulation Program, GIMP is the one true free competitor to Photoshop. First created in 1995 when it was, and this is true, named for the character in the movie Pulp Fiction, GIMP has a reputation as a less capable and harder to use version of Photoshop, which is still kinda true, which is why I'm here to help. But here's the thing, it's available for every operating system, Windows, Mac, Linux, it's translated into more than 80 languages and and this is important, it's not a one-time only purchase, it's not available for a 30-day trial, it absolutely doesn't cost a dime free. All right, so here I am working in GIMP on a PC, Windows that is, if you're working with Mac OS or Linux, things might work slightly differently. Now, I'm assuming that you have at least a kind of passing familiarity with Photoshop, in which case GIMP is gonna seem at once a little bit familiar and a whole lot foreign. Now, by way of familiar, we have a layers panel down right by default. The thumbnails are a little tiny, so I'll click on this incredibly tiny icon right there and choose preview size. Go with something bigger, like enormous. We do have eyeballs, by the way, so you can turn a layer off or back on. Now, by way of unfamiliar, we've got a lot of really super tiny icons, like down here at the bottom of the layers panel, up here at the top of these panels here, and then the tools are just kind of a cluster mess. That is to say, and if you want to make things a little more kind of homey, then go to the edit menu and choose preferences. I swear, this is a great way to go. So it's a good idea to kind of, you know, get things organized correctly in the first place. Switch to icon theme, and then notice down here, you got it. We've got this slider, but it doesn't work until you switch to custom icon size. And then you could crank it up to large, and notice now we have workable icons down right, top right, and where the tools are concerned. Now the tools are grouped logically, even though they're just, you know, sort of thrown together here. But I find them a little bit easier to come to terms with, especially at first if you ungroup them by switching the toolbox and then turning this checkbox off like so. And now you can see that every single one of the tools has a little hint to send you on your way, at which point I'll click OK and if you're enjoying this, if you're finding this to be useful so far, then by all means, take a moment to subscribe. Because after all, what about this marquee that's surrounding this text? Is the text selected? No, it's not. That just indicates that it's active here inside the layers panel. It's not even the text that's active, by the way. That's the text, but I don't really find marquees to be helpful unless I actually have an active selection outline. So to turn it off, go to the view menu and I mentioned this in part because anytime you feel at sea inside GIMP go to the view menu it's going to help you a lot and I'll turn off layer boundary right there and then it goes away now I want to draw your attention to the panels top right they may look totally different for you and there are tons of panels to choose from just as there are in other programs to get to those panels, because they're much more helpful than the ones that are shown by default, go to Windows and choose, of all things, Dockable Dialogues. There's a new term. And then notice there's colors. That's the one that I have up on screen right now. But you also have, for example, navigation so that you can get around. Now, speaking of get around, the getting around that is, notice that I have three documents open and I can tell that's the case because I'm seeing tiny little thumbnails for them top left and so I can just click on a thumbnail in order to switch to that image which I find to be quite handy here on the PC another way to work is to press alt along with the number so alt 3 will take me to the third image open alt 1 to the first image alt 2 back to where I was now I want to zoom in if I press control plus nothing's gonna happen and so again when you encounter that kind of behavior go to the view menu and then in my case, I'm gonna choose zoom and notice right there, zoom out is minus, zoom in is plus. And then we have revert zoom, which is really great. It toggles between different zoom levels from, from the current one to the last one. Really great, great way to work. Just try it out. I'm gonna go with zoom out here. And so I could zoom out again just by pressing minus. So you don't need the modifier key, but if you press plus, it doesn't work. And that's because 
Well, think about it, I guess. It's really the equal key, right? If you want plus, you have to press shift plus, which is eh, a little bit, you know, relying on semantics, but whatever. Anyway, notice that it's getting kind of off center right there. If you want to center things at the current zoom level, you press shift J. That's just the way it is. And then if you want to fit the image on screen, you add the control key. So it's control shift J like so, as opposed to control zero inside other applications, which is going to open a previously open image, which can prove a little bit confusing. So just, just remember that one. You got shift J, control shift J. All right, now what I wanna do is something a little more elaborate. I wanna create this composition right here where I've selected this woman with all of her hair and set her against a different background. And so what I'm gonna do is select her automatically. Now in Photoshop, obviously you have select subject, remove background. Here you have a very powerful command, although it is exceedingly odd as so many things are inside GIMP. It's this tool right here. Notice it, the foreground select tool. Great idea, right? It selects a foreground image automatically. Only by automatically, I mean after you jump through a bunch of hoops that you would never predict. I don't think, unless you think like whoever designed this feature. And so here's what you do. I'm gonna show you, it's really great. Hey, real quick, is this video making you curious? Is it making you wonder what else this free but powerful program can do? Then join my Patreon, which is patreon.com slash deeknow and learn some very practical ways to make GIMP work for you. And while you're at it, get 10% off this fetching t-shirt. You click like so around the image or you drag if you want to. You just have to create a, a lasso and then you have to complete it. So you have to go back to the starting point. That's not enough. Notice that we have this little floating window here with a dimmed select button. To get things going, you now have to press the enter key. That is a necessary step by the way. And then we've got a kind of brush that's going. Now this is great. Here we have a familiar keyboard shortcut. You can make the brush smaller by pressing and holding the left bracket key, bigger by pressing and holding the right bracket key. So the standard square bracket keys that we've come to know and love in Photoshop, for example. And now I would just paint. This is patently absurd. But you paint inside the image to basically say to Gimp, hey, this is an example of the foreground. Don't go out here into the hair. You don't want to do that. Just stay with the real obvious stuff. And then you're going to have a kind of overlay. You can keep painting, by the way, if you want to. Don't worry about the color of the brush. That doesn't matter. And then we're just going to see that some things are bluish, meaning that they're undefined so far. And then some things we are the actual colors of the image. And that means they will be selected. This thing right here determines the overlay color in case you want to change that. And now what you do is you click on the select button up here in this little window and you're going to get some kind of alert message. Now, what I recommend, I'm serious about this, is I'd never suggested this in a piece of software before. Get out a stopwatch and hit start because Within two to three to five minutes, you're gonna get a result, but you'd never know from the feedback that you're getting from GIMP. And so in other words, have faith that it's working. Just go do something else. Work inside of a different application, grab your phone, what have you. All right, my stopwatch is closing in at a minute, so I'm guessing that I'm just about to get a selection outline. And sure enough, I'm right. So it really does help. It just, you know, it just, it provides you with a sense of security because otherwise it's like the program crashed. All right, now we have, you can see a very articulated selection outline at this point, which is great. Now I have the layer I want to work on selected. So I'm gonna drop down to the little mask icon. Notice it looks like a theater mask and I'll click on it. Now that's not gonna automatically convert the selection to a, to a layer mask. What you have to do is select one of these options. So if you just leave it set to white, then you're gonna create 
an empty layer mask. You don't want that. You want to convert the selection. There it is. So select that item and then click add and that will give you a selection outline like so. Now at this point, you probably want to deselect the image, but don't press control D because that will duplicate the image. You'll get an actual duplicate that you could work on independently if you want to, but the shortcut we're looking for is control shift A just so as you know. And speaking of which, up in the edit menu, notice that right there, undo is control Z, redo is control Y. If you press control shift Z, as we've become accustomed to inside other applications, Photoshop among them, then that's a hard redo and a strong undo, pardon me, is what it's called. And what that means is it skips anything like just switching layers and that junk. So it can be a little bit confusing but again you know any new software is going to take some adjustment i would think now what i want to do is add a new background to this image and so i'll switch to this image right here and these by the way these photographs come to us from dreams time the dreams time image library link in the description and so there's a lot of different things you can do you can copy you can then paste a new layer if you want to the way i like to work i'm going to show you this is snazzy i'm going to drag the thumbnail from the layers panel so it's great that it's so big and then I'm going to move it over the thumbnail for the image and then I will move my cursor into the image window and drop. Isn't that awesome? And we get a new layer like so and now I'll move it below the woman and we have a pretty good transition. Is it perfect? It is not, but it looks pretty darn great. Now this, this outline around the image is bugging me. So this is, well, I'm going to go to the view menu and choose shoe, uh, <laughs> shoe, show a layer boundary to turn it off. And I mentioned that because that is something you have to do on an image by image basis. Although there is a preference setting. All right. Now for the bad news so far, that was all good news. This, this, this will surprise you. I think it'll surprise a lot of you anyway. We do not have dynamic effects inside this program. We were supposed to get them, like adjustment layers. We don't have. And layer effects, a Photoshop 5 feature, we do not have. We were supposed to get them this year, 2024, but now we're hoping for next year, 2025. We will see. But in any event, what I want to do is switch to this type layer. It is live type. By the way, I could switch to the text tool right here. And what's cool, I think this is awesome, is that when you select letters, it shows you the bounding box for each letter. So it shows you the, the height with the ascender and the descender and all that. That's great. And this is editable text, by the way. I'm just going to escape out. But I just want a drop shadow. That's all I want. And so hopefully, cross finger go to the filters menu right there choose light and shadow and oh they're, they're available sometimes they're dimmed if they're dimmed you just have to kind of switch between images and wake things up but in any event we've got drop shadow and we've got long shadow long shadow by the way will create an extrusion effect which can be really great but drop shadow is what i want but bear in mind this is a static effect and it's very unsatisfying i'll show you the better way to work in just a moment but choose drop shadow and we've got this just crazy dialogue box i think but anyway each one of these xy for example these are slider bars so you can actually drag inside of them to slide them do you see the shadow forming right here and i could crank the opacity i've got it set very low i'll want to i'm gonna crank it way high that's pretty, a, a two, by the way, is 200%. So I might take it down to something a little bit lower, but this way we can see it. And then we have a blur radius. So you can set how blurry your drop shadow is. But notice that even though you have color control, so I'll go ahead and click on color here to bring up this little color panel. And we have HSV. For those of you who like HSB in Photoshop, V is value, but it's pretty much the same thing. And then you could dial in a color if you want to, or you can grab this little eyedropper and click someplace in the background, like on a kind of darkish purple, for example. And now we get a purple drop shadow. Only thing is, of course, it is opaque, so it's not a shadow. Right? It's just sitting there. It's just a thing on top of the background. I want it to blend into place by changing the mode, of course, the blending option mode to multiply. Only thing is it doesn't do anything. In fact, it makes the shadow go away, which is bizarre. 
probably a bug, but the problem is by default, it's set to replace. You can set it to normal, but it's linked to the layer. So it's not, it's going to have the same blend mode the layer does. So it can't have a different blend mode. And notice this gets worse. Notice that this is a live text layer. So I could edit the text. In other words, if I click OK, though, I rasterize the layer. It doesn't even have the common courtesy to tell me that it's rasterizing, but it does do that. And now we have a shadow that's baked into the type, which is not going to do us any good. So the better way to work. I just want to tell you this. I undid that. Notice we have editable text once again. You go to the filters menu. You wouldn't know this. Choose light and shadow and choose drop shadow legacy. And, and that's because the reason it's legacy, it's not as good in a way. It, it, you can't preview. Notice if I change these things to like 20 offset. Actually, I'm going to crank it up to 50 offset because I really want a lot of room here. And I'll take the blur radius up to 30, what have you. Take the opacity to anything you want. It doesn't matter. 69. Remember that because we'll see that in just a moment. I'm going to click on the color swatch. We've got the eyedropper once again. Click in the background like so in order to lift a shade of purple. That's great. Not previewing a darn thing. Working blind. Click OK. But see, the great thing is I got an independent layer and I still have live editable text. Now, if I edit the text, the drop shadow is not going to edit along with it. But still, this is something. And now I can switch to the drop shadow and move it around by grabbing the move tool which has a keyboard shortcut of M. I just want you to know these shortcuts are different all over the software. All the shortcuts are different. And you would think you'd just be able to drag the drop shadow around, but here's the thing. Look at these tiny little icons. They're, they're, right now, selection is active, even though there is no selection active. So I can't drag a selection. So why would that make any sense? Or path. I want to drag the layer around, of course. And then you want to make sure it's not pick a layer because that will drag whatever you drag on you want to move the active layer which is the drop shadow in this case and then drag it around so i just want you to know that's the kind of stuff you're going to run into and by the way now you could nudge it you can use the arrow keys to nudge it around shift arrow for bigger increments of course and now you could as you would expect change the blend mode right here to multiply in order to create an authentic, albeit static drop shadow. So what do you think? Thoughts, questions, comment below, and then subscribe and turn on notifications so you know what more I have to share with you in the future. For a look at a few practical things that you can do with GIMP, join me at patreon.com slash deeknow, and then go to deek.com and sign up for my newsletter. I'm Deek McClellan, this is Deek Now.